Hello, everyone. Um, today, um, I'm going to um, present, basically do, um, it's not going to strictly be my research. Uh, you know, basically, it's not going to be the results of my research. But today, I wanted to share with all of you, basically, what is the, um, the field in which I'm doing research. And I really want to give a perspective of where I think this field is going, what has been done already uh, in the past and, in the, you know, the I would say the past decade and where basically my research uh, fits in, you know, in this, in this, in this domain. So I tried to make the presentation as digestible as possible. So I tried to reduce uh, the jargon and I tried to make it um, more like, a, you know, basically like a review of, of, of the state of the art rather than presenting actual results. So again, it will be probably like a bird's eye view uh, kind of thing about the field. And obviously I want to have this, um, as interactive as possible. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat. I'll, I'll take a look at the chat uh, while I'm presenting. So uh, let me share the screen. So hopefully you should be able to, to see the screen. Okay, so the agenda for, for today will be um, these this four topics. So I will start. I'll kick it off by, you know, basically describing what is a biosensor, what makes it different from a general, you know, sensor. Um, I will then make a panoramic of what is the field of solivomics, why is that relevant, and what is, you know, the, you know, saliva differs from other biofluids that we could be interested in um, in the field of diagnostics. And then I will introduce the term uh, lab in a mouth. Um, obviously, you know, detailing the different aspects of how, you know, this, this lab in the mouth is helping with the new, uh, uh, you know, the, the new, basically the new advances in, 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 in diagnostics. And lastly, I will, uh, basically show you what I think could be really the future for this field and, you know, maybe, you know, potentially, um, what will be the challenges associated with that and what will be, you know, the, the big unlocks, the big benefits that that could, you know, potentially bring. But first, a uh, little introduction about me, just a few minutes. Um, I started off, you know, my, with my bachelor uh, in my hometown. I started with, um, you know, studying chemical and biochemical engineering because I was really interested in chemistry. And then I decided to switch to material science um, because I was particularly interested about how, you know, the materials could be, you know, new innovative materials could be used um, in, in the field of medicine. Um, and so that really, uh, that, that's basically what pushed me to, uh, to do the master at Georgia Tech. Uh, but I actually ended up not, not, uh, working in the, in the medicine field, but more in the robotics where I was developing, uh, a stretchable and flexible sensors for, uh, for robotic systems. And then I got a possibility to basically, you know, uh, fulfill my, my, my dream, my academic dream of working at the intersection between engineering and medicine during my PhD, where I am now currently uh, developing a, a point of care device, I will get into that later, um, for oral health assessment. So basically a device that could tell you, you know, how good or bad it is, you know, is the, the status of your, of your oral cavity. Um, and so, yeah, my research interests are really at an intersection between uh, flexible social electronics uh, and biochemical sensor with a, you know, with a good focus also like on wearable devices, because uh, I'm really interested in wearable, even if, you know, I'm developing a point of care device now. So let's start with the, the basic question that, uh, you know, uh, what, what you should, what I would like you to know, uh, if you don't know it already at the end of this, at the end of this talk, and it's basically, what is a biosensor? So a biosensor by definition is a device that is able to um, translate a biological uh, reaction into a measurable signal that we as, you know, humans or I'll say machines could uh, interpret and use uh, for, you know, specific purposes. And so a, there's a lot of biosensors in our life. And I'm pretty sure that some of you have interacted with, with those. I mean, uh, at least during COVID, we've seen a few examples, but I would say the most uh, widespread example of the biosensor of a biosensor is the glucometer. 
So the glucometer basically works. Uh, the device sensor is in that strip that you see plugged in into the device. So the strip is actually the bias sensor. Um, the, the whole device is more like a biosensing system where you have a readout device that is the, the little device, and then you have the bias sensor that is the strip. And so what it does, it basically, you know, takes the blood from, uh, for example, a sample of blood, and it can tell you, you know, your, your glycemic concentration uh, using the bias sensor that is plugged in. But this could sound complicated if you don't know exactly how that is made. So let's try to, um, you know, take apart the different elements of a biosensor. A biosensor is basically composed of four different elements. The first one is the analyte. Uh, the analyte is basically what we want, um, what, what we're researching. What is, you know, the molecule that we're trying to find in a specific sample. Could be a biofluid, could be a wastewater, could be uh, even like a solid sample. There's some biosensor for, sort of for solid samples. And so the analyte uh, tells us the type of molecule that we're researching. If, if we're looking at a DNA string, it's very different than if we're looking at a, you know, a glucose molecule, for example, or an ion, for example, you know, if we're looking at iron or cobalt and so on. And so the analyte is really the, the, the first thing that you, um, that you want to know, you want to be sure about when you're developing a biosensor, because everything else really depends on your analyte. And in order for us to detect, to basically see that biological reaction happening, um, we need to have something else to detect the analyte, and that is a receptor. Uh, receptors can have a lot of different shapes and natures, and so uh, you know the, the the most used ones are enzymes. So, for example, the the glucometer that you saw before that uses an enzyme as a receptor that is glucose oxidase. That is basically what allows us to see that um, to, to actually make that biological. Um, the biological reaction happened. But there's also antibodies, for example, the one that we, you know, we used uh, for detecting COVID, um, for detecting the, the, the COVID spike protein in, um, uh, during, you know, COVID times. And then you can use also nucleic acids and, and cells. And so now you have an analyte and you have a receptor. So these two binds and allow you to, you know, see that biological reaction. But how can you actually see it? Well, you need to have something called a transducer that basically does the translation part. So take the biological information and put it into something that we can, you know, analyze and see. And so transducers are, there are several types. I would say that the most used ones, the more, um, the ones that are more widespread are electrochemical sensors. So electrochemical transducers allow you to translate a biological reaction that could be a redox, so like a phoretic or non phoretic reaction into a measurable signal. Optical uh, transducers do something similar, but in this case, you're not measuring, uh, you're not getting as an output. Uh, you're basically uh, monitoring the optical properties uh, of, of your, you know, of your system. And same applies with thermal and piezoelectric. In piezoelectric sensors, for example, you're measuring a, a, a change of mass. So for example, let's say they have a receptor and that receptor is on a little, you know, uh, miniature scale. When that receptor binds with the analyte, um, what you see is a change in mass, and that is how piezoelectric um, transducers work. And so what you see uh, below is basically an example of that, what, we're, uh, what I'm saying. We have glucose on the left as the analyte. We have that strip that is the whole transducer because that strip has a, um, a transistor in there um, that is basically our transducer. And the resistor, on top of the resistor, we have the receptor. And the receptor is that uh, layer that you see on top of the of the orange um, of the orange um, elements, and that uh, receptor is the one that binds with the analyte. The transducer translate that, and what we get out of it is the signal output. So we ultimately want to receive something that we can interpret, understand, um, you know, ideally on our desktop device or on a mobile device, so we can store the data and use the data for you know for. Uh, later applications. And so this is really, uh, in a few words, what is a biosensor? What you should really remember about a biosensor? And also what makes it different from a sensor? The sensor is different from the biosensor because it doesn't have 
the bioreceptor elements that, you know, gets, you know, that, that, that basically makes the biological reaction, uh, reaction. Happen. So sensors do not have any biological element in, in them. And so that's why they differ from, from a biosensor. Um, so there's a lot of biosensors that we have seen in, 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 in our life and they've changed in a way that it's probably simple to, uh, very simple to what we've seen already in the past. And that is computing. So if you think about computing, we have started with something like uh, the device on the on the left. So this, you know, big machines that could, you know, take on a take up a, the the space of a room, um, and then we reduce the the form factor of those machines into portable devices like our laptops that we can, you know, bring to work and bring back home. And then ultimately, we're now uh, more and more going into the wearable format where we have this machines, these computers that can fit inside, um, inside a clock. And so now we have, you know, this, this Marvel watches have a lot of computing power that can, you know, do a lot of amazing things that were not even remotely uh, possible even 20 years ago. And so if you, if you look at this reduction in form size, you will notice that something similar is happening, um, in the biomedical device space. So we've started with something bench up like, like this, like the glucometer that you, uh, that you put on, uh, on, you know, on the desk. And then we've reduced the form factor, uh, to bring it basically into a wearable format where now you have a portable glucometer that you can, you can carry around and you can use, um, whenever you need it. And now we're starting to see with Abbott, this is a, this is a device from, from Abbott. Now we're starting to see the first appearances of uh, wearable devices. So where you don't even need to bring the device anymore is more like the device that is coming with you um, on, your, on your arm, like in the case of the Abbott sensor where you have a needle that is inside your skin and continuously um, you know, gets, gets the blood from, 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 your, uh, from your arm and allows to take the analysis that you normally do with a, with a portable device. And so again, what we're seeing here is something that we have witnessed already and we are currently witnessing with um, computing. And so going from benchtop to wearable formats. Biosensors are, as I said, ubiquitous. Uh, there's a lot of different sensors that we have that we're currently interacting with in our life. And so um, this, is a, um, this is a figure from a paper. This is a great uh, review paper. Uh, that came out uh, three, four years ago about uh, wearable sensors that can show you um, in a really easy way, like, you know, really um, visible way, how we could really um, use sensors everywhere in our body. We have sensors that can be used in the mouth as, you know, mouth guards. And I'll, you know, I'll be talking about that today, but we have sensors that can be embedded even in smart, uh, in, in contact lenses. Uh, and so obviously, you know, the, the most, um, uh, the biggest advances in the field have been made in the, in the field of, uh, sweat sensing, because it's really easy to access. And so we've seen a lot of different examples of, uh, sweat patches and sweat sensing devices that you can attach in your skin. But we've also seen examples of, uh, sensors that can be, uh, used in textile formats. So now you are embroidering some, uh, some sensing fibers. Um, in your, um, in your textile elements and you can wear those and you, you wouldn't even, you know, feel the difference, but now you'll have something that is embedded, um, uh, in your, maybe in your, in your shoe, on your socks, and now it can sense, uh, stuff from your skin. So again, the field is moving really quickly and there is a possibility to gather information from our body pretty much everywhere. And, you know, research is showing this, showing this already, but it will be, it will be too long for me to tackle all of these elements at the same time. And so today I want to uh, restrict a bit the field of wearable, um, sensing, wearable and, and point of care sensing to, um, a specific part of our body that is basically the aura cavity. And so what I want to do today is. Introducing the field of salivomics, maybe some of you are familiar with the term already, 
maybe some are not. Uh, Salive Omics as a term basically was born, I would say, not more than 20 years ago. So it's a rather new field, but we've seen a lot of research coming out in this, in this domain, especially after COVID, after basically people started to um, use the saliva based uh, tests instead of, instead of the swab tests for, uh, you know, to detect COVID-19. And so what is salivomics? Salivomics really using saliva uh, instead of other biofluids. So for example, instead of using blood, that is the, the gold standard uh, for the majority uh, of tests. Um, so instead of using, you know, uh, blood as a biofluid, we use saliva. Why would you, why, why would you use saliva instead of blood? Well, first of all, saliva has, is um, easily uh, accessible. So it's not like blood is not uh, painful to obtain. It is um, continuously renovated. So if you think about it, you produce a lot of saliva during the day. And so if you want to take an average of what is the concentration of a specific molecule, you can do that because the you know, saliva is continuously uh, renovated in your body. So as I said, it's non-invasive, it's easy, stress-free, it is repeatable, and also it doesn't carry any um, risk of contamination as it could be, for example, the case for, for blood. The only thing you need to be um, you know, aware of with saliva is that it is really dependent on what you eat. So maybe if you want to take a test, you, unless you're, you're, you know, your desire is, is to measure something that is related to your diet, you maybe don't want to take the test right after uh, you know, you've, you've had lunch or, uh, or, any, yeah, or any type of yeah, any type of meal. But apart from that, I would say saliva is an extremely promising fluid. Um, when compared to others that we, that we have already. And saliva has a lot of different molecules in it. So you can really gather information uh, from, from several uh, different uh, subdomains of, you know, you could be interested to. So for example, we've seen uh, research coming out where you could detect to the single, uh, to the single molecule. Uh, so we're talking about atomolar concentrations of stuff in saliva in the same way as obviously, you know, with different devices, uh, you can detect much bigger molecules, like for example, you know, glucose and, and cholesterol. So really, uh, saliva has a lot of different molecules that are interesting, and they could each be targeted in a different, uh, you know, in a specific way um, by using the uh, the right receptors, as I, as, I, as I've shown before. Really, the key is about finding the receptor to target a specific analyte in your saliva. So as I said, the field of salivomics, salivary diagnostics, how you want to call it, was really, you know, born, uh, I would say 20 years ago, uh, when, you know, first examples coming out with uh, some, some biosensor that you can see on the left. Now, uh, in, in this image, you can see it's basically like a, like a time scale where um, you can see how we've evolved. So we've started, I would say the first example um, coming out in a, in a paper on nature is the one you see in image B, that is a tooth uh, animal biosensor. So this biosensor is basically a, a strip, is a resonant antenna. So basically it's a device that you can interrogate in a, you know, similarly to what you do uh, with your phone, you can send, um, you basically can send some waves to the sensor and the sensor sends the waves back. Um, and depending on, you know, there's a receptor on top of the, of the antenna, uh, that receptor binds to a specific molecule. And so depending on how, what is the concentration of your analyte, the response that you get back in terms of waves differs. And so you can draw basically a, um, you, you can basically draw a, 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 a curve that can tell you what is the concentration of a specific analyte uh, depending on this, on the response of the sensor. So that was really the first example of, okay, we can create a sensor that we can put on top of a tooth and people could potentially wear it. Now, obviously wearing a sensor on top of your tooth is probably not the most practical way to, to, to do, you know, diagnostics. And so that's why we have evolved from that initial idea into something more practical. So now we have, for example, mouth guards, um, that could have, you know, that could house sensors and, and that's way more practical because you can remove the mouth guard. You can wash them off guard if you, if you need to, um, but you're still going to have the sensor there and it's not attached to your tooth. And so we've seen examples, um, 
of different mouth guards uh, that you can wear uh, and that can, you know, give you information about different, um, you know, different analytes. But really, we have also seen a lot of um, new research coming out uh, relatively to point of care devices. So for now, I've only talked about wearable devices, but in some cases, you don't really need a wearable format unless you, you're tracking something that consistently varies during the day. And so it's much easier to just carry out a test uh, in the same way as you would do in, in, in a laboratory. But in this case, you could do it comfortably at your home without having to go to the hospital because you have this point of care device that you can use and, and use it for live. So you don't even have to uh, finger prick or, you know, take, take, take blood out. It's normally something that you would do in a laboratory setting. Um, so yeah, this is again, is to show you how the field have really started to put out research, you know, a bit more than, than, than 10 years ago. And we have already advanced a lot because a lot of, you know, research is pointing in this direction for either a uh, point of care or uh, wearable devices. So let's now focus on only the wearable. Uh, part of this, because probably the you know the one is most exciting about this this field of research, not because the point of care is not, um, but because of the point of care device. Um, some of these devices have already entered the market, and so there is a maturity mm -hmm. of the field that is basically acknowledged, and so there's many more players uh, looking at that than we have on wearable intraoral devices, and so today I, as I said. I wanted to introduce the concept of lab in a mouth. Um, you've probably heard already about the concept uh, lab in a skin on a skin. If you um, if you have dealt with um, uh, sensing wearable sensing, and it's basically the concept of having translating all of the techniques, you know, all of the um, capabilities of a laboratory from a laboratory setting to a wearable form. So. Lovely skin basically takes in, you know, microfluidics to get the sweat and drive it to the sensing element and then carry out the sensing and send out um, the, um, you know, the response, also send out the data to a mobile device where the data can be interpreted. So you have all of the functions already in your body. So now we are doing the same for saliva. And so we're calling it lobbing a mouth. What is, what is that really about? The concept of loving about is using the oral cavity as the house for sensors. And uh, there's a lot of different sensors that can be, uh, that can be created and that can work in a, an oral cavity setting. So, you know, as you can see here from the image, we have a variety of sensor for a variety of different uh, targets. So we can detect viruses in the same way as we can detect bacteria, drugs, electrolytes, and metabolites when we're talking about the biochemical sensors. But then we can also, and that's the first one that I'm going to focus on, uh, just because it's the easier, uh, the easier version of the sensors, um, because are those that are not biochemical in nature. And so we're talking about clenching and movement sensors uh, and also temperature sensors. But let's, let's dig into into these two, uh, into these two different uh, sensors. So these are sensors, first of all. These are not biosensors, but I still wanted to make an introduction on these two because I think it's important to uh, to mention um, these devices. So intraoral physical sensors, what they do, they uh, monitor the change of a specific physical property. So uh, if you know what bruxism is, uh, of if you suffer from bruxism, you know how difficult it is to detect this pathology. And so what people came up with was some wish, some research groups have, has came up with is basically uh, creating a, a comfortable substrate that you can, that you can wear. So like a cleaner liner or like a mouth guard that you can wear. And that has force sensors embedded in the device. So now what you can do is you can go to bed, you can wear uh, this, you know, this devices and these devices are able through this force sensors that will Literally, some, some, some printed foils, okay? You can embed the sensors on the substrate and now you can wear a device at home and the device can measure whenever you have, you know, the, 
the two uh, parts that the, the you know the the, the teeth have, have, have touched each other, and so you can monitor that throughout the night, and you could you know potentially you know using some algorithm detect whenever you had some some bruxism events, and so this is really really powerful is a really powerful way to um, detect a specific pathology without having to go um, for for example to the clinic and stay there one night to to be examined or even you know buy expensive machinery. Uh, to get a home to be diagnosed this this pathology. So this is a, a really great example on you know how we could potentially use uh, physical sensors. Another interesting use case that you see here in figure D um, is using these devices for all of those ports. And I'm thinking about you know American football where you can get concussions. Because in the mouth you can measure um, you know all of this you know shocks by embedding a gyroscope that can tell you, you know, the acceleration and deceleration of your mouth uh, in a 3D space. And so you could easily use this um, to monitor specific events and potentially issue some warnings whenever, uh, you know, an athlete has got a, um, you know, has got hit by, by, by something. And so that could have potentially created a concussion event. And so that's, that's really important. That, that's a device that could really, um, could be really useful uh, to avoid some of, you know, some, some, some really bad consequences out of, out of sports. And you can see here, uh, sometimes, you know, a question that I get asked uh, a lot is how can you fit, you know, how can you fit all of these functions on a clear liner? If you know what a clear line is, is, is a really, uh, you know, little piece of, a piece of plastic that you wear, um, and, and, and so how can you fit all that into, you know, all, all the sensors into, into that element? Well, microelectronics has really come, you know, very far into like, you know, in terms of like the form factor. So now we can have this tiny chips, as you can see in the, in, in the slide, that can, you know, have a lot of different, a lot of different, you know, capabilities and can allow a lot of different, um, you know, detections. And, you know, same applies for batteries and other electronic elements that you need on, you know, to, to perform uh, sensing and biosensing. So that's, that's why we can do this now. And we, wanted, we, we weren't able to do it, you know, 20 years ago um, in the same way as we've done with, with computers. So the, the, second, um, the second section that I want to look at is that of electrolytes and metabolites. Um, the reason why we are differentiating here um, it, it, it basically has a specific meaning. So there's some molecules that are easier to detect um, when compared to others. So if you're looking at a specific, you know, uh, MI, RNA, or if you're looking at glucose, the concentration, probably the concentration of these two analytes will be different. And so depending on the concentration of the analyte, the uh, accuracy of the receptor they will have to, to use will also be different. And so that's why we are characterizing this based on the analyte. As I told you at the beginning, the analyte is, is really what makes the difference. You know, what, what you really need to measure, okay? And so we're looking at electrolytes and metabolites because those are the uh, easier ones. Let me, you know, let me say easier ones um, to detect. And that's what usually people start from when developing sensors, unless they have already, you know, the, the capability in the end, the know-how to get into other, other um, analytes. And so a few examples of these are um, of these sensors for biochemical analytes. Um, the, the first one that you see uh, panel, basically all of these panels, the concept is pretty much the same. You're using either a clear liner or another device that you put up in the poly, or in the case of uh, figure H and figure E, um, you, you're using a pacifier. So in this case, you're basically functionalizing something that already exists uh, by adding chemical sensors to it. Really clever move. And so all of these are measuring uh, specific electrolytes. So for example, in panel A, we're looking at uh, lactate. Uh, in panel B, we're looking at uh, uric acid. Uh, in, panel, in panel C, for example, and in panel, in, panel C, we're in panel C, we're looking at glucose and sodium in panel G and so on. So um, as you can see, the difference 
it is really on like how you wear the device. Um, but the end, the end goal is basically the same. The idea would be to measure for a specific amount of time, the concentration of a specific analyte. So in this case, if we're uh, interested in knowing what is the concentration of, of, of sodium uh, in, a, in, a, you know, in a person's saliva, what we want to do is create a device that is able to uh, tell the different uh, flavors, basically, you know, to, to discriminate between um, different, different foods um, by just using the sensor. And so uh, that proof of concept, as we've shown in, in, in uh, the figure of the panel, uh, the figure G, where basically the, the authors were able to uh, discern, you know, based on the pattern of uh, the concentration of sodium, and they were able to tell the difference between a potato chip, a, a chicken soup, or a bag of juice. And, you know, similarly, uh, you can see in, in panel C and D, you can see the difference in, in glucose whenever, you know, glucose uh, was present in specific concentrations. And so th these devices are able to work for a, you know, I would say a prolonged period of time because it's done a punctual um, analysis. It's more like a time-based analysis. And so these are the devices we're able to, to work for, you know, up to 30 minutes and constantly measuring the concentration of um, a specific analyte uh, and tell the difference between, you know, healthy people and, and, and patients that had, you know, so specific, uh, specific pathologies, as you can see, for example, in, in panel B, where uh, just by looking at the graph, you can tell what an healthy person and a, a patient with hyperuricemia had in terms of like concentration of uric acid. The, the second, um, a, a second, you know, um, a second section is devoted to drugs because saliva can also be used to uh, do drug detection. And so again, research groups have, have started to come up with really clever solutions to monitor the concentration of, blood, of, of drugs. And so let's, let's dig into that and, and take a look at what, what people have done. So um, the first one is basically um, a detection that is colorimetric. And so this is not, for example, a wearable sensor. This is a point of care uh, sensor, but it works in a very simple way. There is a, there's a molecule that changes. Uh, there's, a, there's an element that changes color. In this case, it's iron um, and a necromophore, uh, necromophore that is, you know, MDCH. And so you insert a sample and that changes color. And it can tell you, you know, this based on a colorimetric uh, detection can tell you the presence of a specific um, analyte and its concentration. Uh, panel, uh, the, the figure in, uh, in the panel, uh, figure B, is, a, is an iteration of that original idea of embedding sensors on a tooth. Uh, this one is a tiny sensor that is based on two rings and it works in a similar way as I said before. You basically can send wave to this. This is an antenna, so it's a resonator. You can send wave to this resonator and what you get back is a response that depends on the thickness of that layer that is between the two antennas. Now that layer is sensitive to the concentration of alcohol. And so uh, basically that will change its thickness depending on the concentration of alcohol. And again, you could, you would be able to uh, distinguish between different, um, different, uh, different drinks based just on the measure of, of that, you know, of the, of those, of those waves that you get back. Um, and so, and be able to discriminate between different, the, between different drinks. Um, another interesting idea, uh, yeah, and I say interesting, it's because it's, it's not a, a wearable intraoral a sensor per se. It's still a wearable sensor, uh, but it's one that you can wear as a ring. And I'm talking about figure D. Uh, in this case, the, um, the authors came up with a clever design of creating a ring that you could uh, basically open. It had a electrochemical sensor inside a ring and you could deposit saliva on the sensor and it could, you know, instantly tell you, um, we're talking about, you know, the time of like, you know, 30 to 60 seconds, can instantly tell you um, the concentration of alcohol in, in your blood and basically, you know, can discriminate if you're drunk or not. Um, and same with uh, THC. So if you have assumed, uh, uh, marijuana or not. And so that could be used, for example, 
um, to do some personal screening whenever you're going out and you want to check, you know, concentration, maybe you don't have either, you know, anything to, to, to measure and the concentration of alcohol uh, at hand, but you could have a device like this that could, you know, easily tell you um, if you're suited or not, uh, if you're, you know, within, within the limits uh, of consumption or not. And so, again, this is a proof of concept, but that's, you know, the idea of what we could potentially, you know, see in the future. Um, another, another example in this case of a, of a point of care device is the one in figure app where the authors have created a, a point of care device. So it's like a miniaturized uh, by, you know, by a sensing system that could tell by, um, you know, depositing a drop of saliva on those strips that are disposable. So you can keep the device, but you can change the strips whenever those are used. Can tell you the concentration of methamphetamine um, with a single drop of saliva. So different approaches uh, with the same end goal of doing drug detection uh, through saliva. The uh, third and uh, last one that I want to look at uh, with a specific example is that of viruses. And so we, you know, we we all know how you know. Uh, painful it was, not really painful, but well, de definitely not comfortable uh, to do, uh, you know, this, to, to, to do the swap test, to, to test for COVID during COVID times. And so why couldn't we use saliva? Well, people thought about it um, and they actually uh, developed sensors to do so uh, with, in some cases, a pretty good accuracy as well. You know, I, I would say at least comparable to, to the swap test. And so in this case, uh, the authors have basically repurposed an already existing um, a glucometer, uh, and you know by you know basically telling the glucometer by basically functionalizing uh, the sensor um, in the glucometer, um, they were able to tell the concentration of COVID nineteen uh, using a a specific uh, a specific reaction uh, between the uh, some aptamers and. So magnetic nanoparticles and the COVID-19 needle spike protein. And so by using, by basically using the, uh, um, some amplification steps and a magnetic separation within a test tube, they were able to basically add sucrose to, um, to the formulation and use Invertaz in the, to turn sucrose into glucose and basically, you know, measure the concentration of glucose uh, in a glucose strip. And so by not even creating a new device, we were able to repurpose something that was already existing um, to measure basically COVID-19 in saliva using an off-the-shelf uh, glucometer. Really amazing, uh, really amazing job, especially considering that the authors here really didn't create any new device. It was all about creating the, you know, the, doing the surface chemistry to, uh, to allow the specific biological reactions that we're looking uh, for to happen on an already existing device that had a glucose oxidase layer on top, as you know, as is always the case with uh, those glucometers. So that was really the, the last example of, you know, what, what can be done in the field of, you know, uh, saliva detection, uh, sal sorry, um, analyte detection in saliva and, and salivary diagnostics. Now, I want to end uh, the talk by um, talking about what could this field be in the future. Okay, so I showed you today, <clears throat> I started by telling you what is a biosensor, how sensors and biosensors have changed, you know, in the, in the past, from the past, you know, today, and how they're probably going to change in the future. Um, I've, I've talked about what is salivomics? Why is salivomics interesting? Why is salivomics promising as compared to other biofluids? And then I did uh, a little, you know, review of what people have used saliva already in research um, to basically detect specific specific molecules and create, you know, wearable or point of care devices um, to perform these uh, diagnostic tests. So now let's look at what this could be in the future. So if you think about the different elements to build the smart health system of the future, the elements are pretty much already there. It's all about 
putting all of these elements together to make them work in a seamless way uh, that could bring a lot of benefits and a lot of, a lot of interesting and promising avenues for both patients and clinicians in the future. So let's start from a very simple element that is the sensor itself. So we've seen that we can now embed sensors in mouth guards, in clean aligners, on, on rings that we can wear. Okay, so everything regarding the substrate and the sensor integration has already been proven in research to work. Now, we also have a lot of different transducers. So we have the possibility to try to detect a specific molecule with different uh, mechanisms. Okay, and so maybe there are some cases in which optical detection is not possible uh, is, is not possible to, to use optical detection. For example, saliva is a really uh, turbid fluid. It's not clear most of the time. Um, and so sometimes it's, diff it's difficult to, to do optical detection in saliva due, due to the, you know, the, the color of saliva itself. And so maybe there's something else that we should use, like an electrochemical sensor. But we have already developed, um, you know, individually, these sensors that work for specific use cases. And so now we have the sensing element, we have the substrates where we could put the elements. Uh, we have saliva that was always available. And now we need something to read, um, uh, to read basically the, you know, the, the reaction. And so there's a signal and data processing that you see now uh, here in, in the figure that is getting cheaper and is getting smaller day by day. Uh, due to all the advances in electronics and microelectronics. And so now power sources are getting smaller, are getting easier to integrate. So in, in some cases, there are some sources that could be fine inside our own body. So there's some examples of uh, some devices that are able to operate without batteries. And so removing the risk from batteries because we're using you know power harvesting from maybe our body, from the temperature of our body, from actually even using some biofuel cells, being able to use specific reactions to produce the power needed to power a specific circuit. And so again, power sources are also rapidly evolving. Batteries are rapidly evolving. They have different form sizes, form factors, different sizes, and they can be easily, they can be easily integrated with uh, microelectronic circuits. And so this brings all of the hardware together. Now we have this hardware, it's small, it's integrated. It can be, it can be, you know, put in the body, it can be, can be worn, can be worn during the day. Now, what do we need? What, what else do we need? We need an infrastructure where we can get all the data from the sensor, from the sensors in a continuous way and using algorithm to process this data continuously to, you know, basically get informed to make, you know, to be able to uh, create a database of information that clinicians can use to take action and to give, you know, informed decisions um, and for the patients. And so now, if you think about this, if you think about this, these elements that are always interconnected, that are using some AI tools that can, you know, extract the most relevant information. And all of this can be done in a seamless way and actually even in fashion, if you think about it, because now every patient could have their own device that they could, you know, wear at home and that can provide information uh, for them or for the clinician. It can, they, they can decide to share this information if they want to. So um, this is how, you know, the, the field, this is not me, this is actually a figure uh, from the review paper where, where I've taken, you know, the, the, you know most of, the, most of the, uh, the images. This is where the field is probably going. There's, there's some elements that are already there. I would say that, you know, most of these elements are already there. What is really missing now is the links, you know, the, the link between the different elements. And this is also, and I'll, I'll, be, I'll be closing, I'll be closing the, the talk on this note. Um, this is also what I'm trying to do with my PhD research. So during my research, I, I said it at the beginning. So um, I also want to reemphasize it at the end. I am developing a point of care device. And so it's a device that you can use um, in the setting, wherever you want to deploy it. It's basically a device that is as big as a, as a smartphone. And, and you can use it to uh, assess 
the, the statues of your oral cavity. So now my idea, you know, the, the idea behind my PhD is basically, you know, developing everything from the ground up. So I'm developing the sensor and developing, I'm basically using some specific materials uh, to detect uh, specific analytes. And so I'm putting that together, I'm putting together the hardware and the idea would be basically to get, you know, data that can be sent to a database where, you know, I could potentially apply some AI tools and extract some relevant information. And so in, you in, know, in the, in the little, um, environment that is my research setting, I am already trying to apply this concept and trying to go, you know, toward what I see as the future of health. And now, you know, the future of health, in my opinion, is something that is continuously interconnected, that it uses devices that we can wear, and that it is always providing, you know, a feed of data that we can decide to share or to, you know, keep for ourselves. But if you want, we can share it with the clinicians and then we can, you know, apply a lot of uh, different interesting tools uh, on big data um, where we can get really good insights into our health. Because now, you know, maybe our data are being compared with some other data and we can get some really interesting information. So in my opinion, um, and I'll be closing here, in my opinion, sensors are a really important element, a really important building block of the health system of the future. Um, because all of this, you know, amazing software tools that we're developing are only useful if you're getting the right hardware tools that uh, allow you basically to gather, to harvest. Uh, the data they need to use to to take the decisions. So I'll be closing here. I'll look if there's any any question in the chat. And um, yeah, that was that was my presentation for today. Hope you liked it. That was awesome, Ricardo. Thank you. Um, I actually had a quick question. If nobody had one right now, um, so I guess my is what are these like obviously for different purposes and if you're in different regions like or like an oral sensor versus like a textile sensor versus a sensor elsewhere probably are comprised of different like biomaterials and things like that is there like a kind of generic biomaterial that people use when they're developing these sensors and like specifically for the oral ones like uh do do, do people test to see if there's like an immunogenic response that's coming from the presence of those sensors and like, yeah, I guess, well, yeah, pretty much that. Yeah. So that's interesting question. Basically, um, there's an easy answer. Yeah. Th there's an easy answer that is most of the time, you know, uh, research groups start by using enzymes and antibodies. They're battle tested. They've been used, uh, for a lot of different applications and in most, you know, in most cases, uh, they can be used also for multi-sensing uh, platforms. So you can have, you know, some, um, some platforms where you can embed, you know, different you know, biomaterials and get simultaneous detection of different analytes. So you don't even have to change the sensor. You can just develop, you know, a multi-sensing platform where you use the different biomaterials. It really depends on the availability of these biomaterials. Most of the time they are available, but the choice is also driven by the costs and the reliability of these biomaterials. So for example, something that, would, something that we've seen is that um, antibodies and um, I would say, yeah, antibodies and enzymes, they tend to have some batch-to-batch -batch variability. And so now when you need to develop a sensor, you need to develop something, you know, unless it's just for research purposes, you need to develop something that is reliable and can be reproduced and can be replicated across a million sensors. So you need to have something that doesn't have a lot of variability. And so now what some research groups are looking into is how can we, you know, create something that is basically, you know, better in terms of like cost and variability when compared to, for example, you know, enzymes and, and antibodies. So there's a really cool uh, niche field that I'm using some of these materials. They're not my materials but are basically biomimicking materials. So for example, there's uh, some materials that are called nanozymes. There are some metallic nanoparticles that mimic the behavior of some enzymes. And so now you have something that is not subject to the naturation, that is not as expensive as an enzyme and could potentially have even better variability, you know, 
And so same applies for the antibodies. There are some research groups that are researching uh, the so-called plastic antibodies. They're called molecular, molecularly imprinted polymers. And so they're basically polymers that are created with, uh, with, the, uh, with the, um, the target molecule when you're creating the polymer, the target molecule is inside the, the metrics of the polymer. And then when it gets created, you know, when the, the polymer gets formed, uh, the analyte is removed. And so what you get is a, is a cavity um, and that is, you know, shape defined. And that is basically, you know, the aim of that is to, to mimic um, the, the behavior of antibodies. So, sorry, long, long reply. Uh, the, the decision on the biomaterials depend on um, your target analyte, depending on the cost and depend on the final application of, of your device. So for example, if you, if you know that you're going to use your biosensor in extreme um, you know, settings, then you probably want to consider something that is you know, synthetic as opposed to a biomaterial uh, for specific use cases. Yeah, that makes sense. Like if it's in like extreme like pHs or extreme like temperatures or something like that, like accommodate for it. Yeah. And then I had like another quick and another quick one about so like the magnetic particles that they use for the COVID um detection. So they use like a biotin streptavidin um like binding complex for that. And um uh I I, I guess do you do you have like any insight? And this might be too niche of a question for it, but like do you have any insight on the size of those particles? Um and do you know like what um what they're made of that like because you like there's different ones that are more or less ferromagnetic um so i'm just wondering if you know what the what comprises those particles because if they're too big sometimes they like can create a net um where it actually like pulls down your like your i know it in the context of cells but it can pull down your cells of interest with um with those beads it like creates a net and pulls away the thing that you don't want it to pull down uh, with it. So I was just wondering like how big those, those beads are. So most probably the beads are, I mean, uh, I'm not, uh, familiar yeah. with this exact, uh, paper. Um, but I have, I've seen, you know, the, most of the beads that are being used, the, the magnetic beads are in the order of the 10 to, uh, to 30 nanometers. So these are the number of particles that are normally being used for, uh, for this specific, uh, sensor. And for this specific application, and the complex is exactly the the one he told uh, the the one the one he said. So the the streptavidin is the one that uh, this this group used. And I would say uh, this is actually a niche application. So probably something that uh, I would have to come back to you because it's a it's a really interesting uh, use of these particles. I would say that magnetic particles are not that used um, in, in sensor development. It's kind of like a niche. Uh, kind of like a niche uh, material to use. And so uh, this is actually a quite interesting paper that I found. Um, and I haven't exactly focused on, you know, the actual development of the sensor. Uh, for me, the highlight here from a pure device perspective was, uh, you know, the idea of using something that was already available as, for example, you know, this, this glogometer and turn it into something, a basically repurposing to, to basically turn it into something that it, was able to do a different detection, a completely different detection, just by using, you know, an Appendorf tube and an already uh, available glucometer. So uh, yeah, really interesting approach. And let me come back to you with something, you know, more specific about, you know, the approach that they use in, in terms of like the, the, the functionalization of the surface with the with the nanoparticles. Yeah, that's legit. 10 to 30 nanometers is like, is like pretty tiny. So that's, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for your questions. Okay. Well, uh, if there's if there's any other question, uh, so if there's no questions, um, but you know, if you want to go back and you know look at the slides again, and you know, hey Molly, yeah. Oh, I was just gonna make a couple comments. Like, I really like your presentation, especially. Uh, I didn't know there was something about the coronavirus too that they were doing with just the saliva. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, just uh, looking at from the clinical lens. Uh, I think like on the clinical side, we'll need more studies where we, when we have all this data available from these biosensors and what it will mean, um, like just an example of how 
you know, continuous glucose monitoring has changed the care of type one diabetes versus, you know, just at point checking of glucose, uh, for people with type one diabetes. Um, similarly, uh, you know, there are other parameters. Now people have their blood pressures and heart rates available all the time. And, uh, what that means versus just a measurement once a month in a clinician office. And, uh, yeah, would be, would be, uh, I, I believe much more focused and better care. Uh, and, and at the same time, I feel like it's going to be a big learning curve, uh, for the providers as well as the patients. Um, just thinking about like, you know, newer medications and when we try to start it on patient and, you know, oh, you have to do this injection at home. And, you know, that just kind of terrifies a lot of people, or there is a new pin that just clicks and it's an injection. So like when these biosensors, uh, I think, um, uh, it will be a lot of education on the patient's part that will be, uh, you know, helping, uh, but yeah. Overall, uh, I like, I like your presentation. Well then, yeah. Thank you, Wally. Uh, let me touch on both of your comments. So the first one is basically we'll need more, more studies on the clinical side to see, uh, to test the efficacies of the sensors. I, I completely agree. So something that we're still lacking, honestly, is on the analyte side, we would need to do, uh, many more studies where we have a, you know, larger, basically batches of samples, um, and we can tell, you know, what are the specific analyzes that we should target for a specific pathology. So here, the bottleneck is, you know, crazy, crazy enough to say the bottleneck is, is not really on the technology side, because we have already demonstrated that we are able to detect, uh, you know, analytes through sensors up to the atomolar range that is basically, you know, 10 to the minus 27. And so the technology is there is more like, okay, now what are, what is, what is a panel of biomarkers that we, that we can tell for sure, if we find these markers in the specific concentration that then you, that we can tell you, you, you know, you have this pathology or not. And that's something that only the clinical, you know, side of it can, can really tell us. So a lot of studies are. I hopefully, you know, going that direction in the future, I would like to see some, you know, many more studies where, you know, results are compared across, you know, cohorts of people to get some, you know, meaningful, meaningful data on the biomarker side. Um, and the, the second comment that was also uh, really, really important and it's something that I'm actually keeping, uh, you know, keeping keep in mind for, for my personal research is we need to develop tools that are, first of all, easy to use. Um, cause people need to use it <laughs> if we want them to, to use it, um, that do not scare people and that are even enjoyable to have. So, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, the, the aura ring and I'm, you know, I'm planning to get one cause I think it's really cool to have, you know, the, to be always, always, you know, in, in have the opportunity to see what's going on in your body, um, for some, you know, specific, specific, uh, you know, levels of markers. And so we also want people to get excited about the biosensors. We want people to be happy to continuously know uh, what's going on in their body. And so a lot of work needs to be done in the education and in creating devices that are easy to use and people are happy to use them because they, you know, because they, they're they getting the information that they need to get and they don't have to, you know, they're basically, we're making their life easier. And at the same time, they're more, in constant, you know, con, you know, uh, in contact with their, with their body, uh, you know, more, uh, more often than what they would do if they were going, you know, to the lab every two to six months to do some specific tests. So yeah, really important comment and something that those, you know, the people that are developing the sensors always need to keep in mind that, you know, we have to, um, we have to face something, we have to create something that can be used, uh, in an easy way. Well, thank you. Thank you all very much for the questions. Uh, I just wanted to say, I'll probably, um, uh, put, the, um, I'll, I'll publish the, sorry, uh, I'll upload, um, the review that I used today for most of the figures on research hub. So if you have any other question that will come up later, just put a comment under, uh, the post and I'll be happy to, you know, reply to the, um, to the question. Uh, but yeah, thank you very much that this has been really a lot of fun and um, I'm looking forward actually to hear the, the other presentation in the, in the series. Catch you all guys.
Bye, Ricardo. Yeah. Bye.